Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are photographer Sarah Andragolian and artist Lloyd Hamrell. Photographer attorney Sarah Andragolian was born in London and raised in Tehran, Iran. And she was also raised in Los Angeles because she graduated cum laude from UCLA with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. She earned her Juris Doctorate degree at UC Berkeley's Bolt Hall. And after she was admitted to the California Bar, she moved to Washington, D.C., where she tried cases with the Justice Department. Then, within two years, she moved to Armenia. You got a Fulbright. I did. And what was the two years at the Justice Department? Was that kind of um, making you think about what was going on in the poverty or the human rights uh, problems in uh, a former republic? Well, my time at the Justice Department was really my first job out of law school, so I was just kind of figuring out what kind of attorney I wanted to be and what I wanted to do with my law degree. And when I was there, I just, um, I really just wanted to move to Armenia and check it out. I had never, I'd gone a few times, I'd never lived there, and um, I felt like the time was right. So I applied for a Fulbright and was lucky enough to get one. How, what do you apply for when you apply for that Fulbright? What do they grant it to you for? Sure. It's through the U.S. State Department, so uh -huh. it's actually a State Department program, and they grant you a 10-month uh, scholarship basically and you have to propose what you're going to be doing be doing in that country yeah and I uh, proposed to study the legal system of a former Soviet Republic that was my proposal oh I see and they I guess figured as an attorney I could probably pull that off so I was granted the scholarship and, and moved out there I was only supposed to be there for 10 months and ended up living there for two and a half years but so the 10 months was a Fulbright exactly and it had to do with the legal the legal system of a former republic. But then you ended up at the American University in Armenia as an associate professor and as an assistant dean. How did that happen? Well, um, when I first moved there, I started to teach classes at the law department. As an attorney, I was... When I, you first got there, you went I, right there? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was kind of lecturing, and then um, I got to know the, the dean of the law department, and then a year into my stay there, they offered me a full-time position as a professor and as an associate dean. So, assistant dean, actually. There was an associate dean, and I was the assistant, so it was... Um, it was fantastic, actually. I, I had the opportunity to teach the first course in women's rights at the university. Oh. But had you been trying any of those kind of cases at the Justice Department? Not really. I was, what were you trying? I was doing consumer cases, actually. Oh. And I, well, in a sense, it was it was a human rights issue because I was uh, defending consumers who had been who had been hurt by products. I see. Oh, I see. So it, I felt like I was sort of the good guy in in those cases. So in a sense, it's kind of the same human rights type of continuum. And when you got uh, to the law school to compare Bolt Hall, which is like one of our staid, wonderful schools in California to the Armenian American University in Armenia? Was there a comparison? Well, you know what was interesting is that what we were trying to do there as sort of westernized lawyers was to bring the uh, western legal methodology to to Armenia. Yeah. And so that was actually a lot of fun. I mean, it, uh, the students weren't really used to that kind of teaching, which was very interactive. Most oh, of the students they were, didn't get to speak. They would exactly. just listen. Well, they were they were uh, more used to sort of memorizing things oh. <laughs> and then coming to class and writing it all down or sort of, you know, in a rote way, just kind of, you know, doing a speech. Did you find them bright like you would have in other uh, law schools, say, or the schools that you went to law school? Definitely. Very bright and very uh, able and, and very motivated. Mm. And, of course, the, the, the students at the American University were really the cream of the crop. They were all um, 
Uh, they all spoke English. You have to have a high level of English to even get into the program. Yes, so many of them wanted to go on to maybe work in, at NGOs or inter international organizations or at the U.S. Embassy, that type of job. So. Did you find any residue from the Soviet system uh, as you were living in Armenia? Oh, everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, from the smallest thing in terms of how people answer the phone in offices to, you know. Really? Sure. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example, oftentimes I found that receptionists would, um, when they would answer the phone, they wouldn't even ask who was calling. If the, if the person that they wanted wasn't there, they would say, not here, please call back. Bang. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the sort of culture of taking messages and trying to... That wasn't... Not really. So, you know, that's just a small example of, of something that but was very But there must have been a me. lot. There was a lot of that. Because it takes so long to go back to before the Soviet time, I guess. Sure. I mean, even the building I lived in, all the buildings were very, very Soviet in their, in their feel and um, interactions between people on the street and between men and women, all kinds of different... You could see all of that from... Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I remember one in one case, uh, I was out at a bazaar with a, with a young Armenian woman, a local woman, and I, you know, I was wearing my jeans and sneakers and just got tired and sat on the curb just to take a break. And she, she wouldn't sit on the curb with me. And, she, and I, I said, you know, Anna, why don't you sit next to me? And she said, you know, Sarah, that's okay for you because everybody knows you're, you know... What, you're a foreigner. <laughs> exactly, but it's not really okay for me. So. so it was like those kind of little differentials. Sure. Well, then, as you were living there, you must have seen not what was going on in the main city, Yerevan, or in the, in the, the populated area, but as you went out into the outskirts, the poverty that was... Uh, or the human rights abuses that were taking place. Mm -hmm. Is that what led you to, I know you have a project, How We Live. Yes. And you did this in conjunction with the Tufankian Foundation, who are a Tufankian, um, uh, James Tufankian is a fantastic mm -hmm. uh, charitable person who's done so much for Armenia. Absolutely. And as far as um, hiring people, bringing industry there. And, and you, how'd you team up with them? And then how did you get your exhibition, How We Live, started? Sure. Um, I, the Tufankian Foundation and I had known of each other because I lived there, so we know, knew of each other's work. And um, the executive director of the foundation, Antrani Kasparian, approached me and asked me if I was interested in returning to Armenia because I was already- Oh, you had already left. Right, so oh, I, I returned to LA in 2005. So oh. I was back in Los Angeles working and Antrani, asked me if I was interested in going back. He knew that I was doing a few different photography projects in Armenia, and he and the foundation had noticed an, a rise in, in extreme poverty in Armenia, and they wanted somebody to document it. I see. When you were, were you photographing when you were living there? Yes. And you were also working, uh, I think, with a video? Documentary, documentary. film studio. How did you do yeah. that? Well, uh, we, uh, I met one of the, the folks at the documentary film studio, and we just kind of teamed up. I was, um, I, although the, the law was kind of paying the bills in Armenia, the photography and the documentary work is I really see. what I was very passionate about. So I started um, producing documentaries on contemporary issues in Armenia through Bars Media. And were they uh, shown? Yes. There? I, well, actually, one of the documentaries uh, won... Um, a top award at Tribeca three years ago. Really? Well, it wasn't a documentary that I made, but one of the documentaries at the studio uh, made So they about did the war. get exposure. Oh, absolutely. About the war where? And, uh, in, in Karabakh. In, in Nagor Karabakh? Yes, and it was actually a co-production with BBC. BBC showed it, uh, so. Oh, so that was great. Yeah. So you s always had your camera with you? Always had my camera with me. And when you teamed up with Tufankian and, and uh, John Kasparian, did you use any of those photographs or did you go back and start a new project? Started all over again because this was about the con uh, contemporary situation in Armenia, about the rise, the rise in poverty. So uh, basically what happened was that I uh, worked with the counselors of the Tufankian Foundation and we did home visits. We visited families in extreme poverty. And this would be one of them? Exactly. This is a family in a village called Gerart, which is about 30 minutes outside of Yerevan. And this family has been living in this tin and wood shack for, gosh, decades. 
at this point. Um, and so I, I photographed them. I, I, I lived with them for, for a day and, um, and basically asked them what life is like for them and documented that. And were they very forthcoming? Um, you know, they, they really were, and I think... Um, because they, they, there's a pride about people in their country, and it's difficult to be forthcoming to someone from the outside. Certainly. I think that the fact that I'm Armenian and spoke the language helped. I think that uh, because they, these folks had already had a lot of uh, interactions with the Tufankian Foundation, and oh, I was being introduced as part of that group, they were very forthcoming. And this is another... This is Simple. Narine, yes, Narine Simonian with the accordion she used to play when she was a young girl. Uh, she's now a single mother. She had a, a very difficult marriage and now is raising four children uh, on her own in the, this dilapidated space that you see in this image. You talk about these situations. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Is there any way that they're going to get out of these situations? Well, I think it's family by family. The answer generally is yes. However, I think that there needs to be a lot of help and a lot of intervention. Um, I think a lot of the families find themselves in cases of poverty uh, for various reasons. Many of the times it's a breakup of the family. Many times it's just hard luck. So I think that what the Tufankian Foundation does is really kind of figure out what the source of the problem is and help help folks that way as opposed to just sort of throwing money at the problem. This looks like a local bank. Yeah. Local yard, local bank. Yeah. I'm saying bank because that's where they go for everything, don't Absolutely. say, to the uh, dump junkyard. This was a massive garbage dump on the outskirts of Echmiadzin, um, which is the fourth largest city in Armenia. This is Grigor. He's only 29 years old, and he supports a family of three by rummaging in the garbage dump. Um, and You're going to show these pictures, and they're gonna, not going to be in this format that we're showing here. Tell us about that exhibition. The exhibition is called How We Live. It, it's a two-night opening, March 26th and March 27th. They are going to, the photographs are going to be enlarged to five feet by seven feet. And it's in, it's in a space that's like a warehouse space, isn't it? Exactly. It actually is a warehouse, a space, warehouse space that, we are, that we've kind of tr transformed. Um, and people are going to be able to have a very one-on-one -on -one experience with these photographs. So they'll be hanging? By a, yes, by a network of wires. Uh, the exhibition is curated by Narine Mirzayan, who is actually an architect with Frank Geary's firm, and she's volunteered her time to do this. And so how many pieces will be in the show? About 38 to 40 pieces. Oh, wow. So you'll be size. walking through 40 pieces, exactly. all hang on, hanging on wire? Exactly. And we're going to have projection screens intertwined in that so that one, you see a still image, and then <coughs> you will see a moving image because we'll have video. Oh, I see. So it's really a multimedia sort of multi-sensory experience. You talk about this only being two days, but can you take this to other places? Well, the... To share what you're doing? We're thinking, well, we're, we're in discussions with the foundation. We're thinking New York is next, so Los Angeles, New York. And ultimately, I would love for this project to go to Yerevan because I think its home really is where the photographs were taken. Well, good luck. Thank Lots you. of good luck. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Lloyd Hamrell, who is a fantastic artist. You see some of his work on the set. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with artist Lloyd Hamrell, and this is his felt piece on the set. I'm feeling it. That's why I'm calling it felt, but he'll talk about it. Uh, Lloyd was born in San Francisco and raised in Los Angeles. He attended Santa Monica College and he earned a Bachelor of Arts and MFA from UCLA. He had his first group show at the CJ Gallery on La Cienega, which was very dear to my heart. I love that. In 1963, and then a one-man show at Rolf Nelson. And Rolf was at the forefront of all the artwork in 1964 and on. But Lloyd's had several exhibitions um, uh, in the city. But almost 10 years later, he showed at Zabriskie in New York. He's taught at several California colleges. And 
all the while working on public commissions. His work is on view in uh, Culver City at the... Um, Cardwell Jimerson Gallery. Thank you, Cardwell Jimerson Gallery. And it's, <clears throat> uh, it's a fantastic show. It's uh, a replica of what you did in the 60s, just what we're it, talking it's about. It's a reprise, it's, it's truly. Um, all the pieces, nine, nine pieces, comprise the original show, and we made everything over again. The whole thing has been refabricated. And when you refabricated, did you have the same materials at hand? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what did no, you have No, no, it's really curious uh, how uh, that particular industry, like every other uh, industry, is technologically sophisticated itself over time. And so I went looking for the original uh, Formica that uh, we used in 1966, and I couldn't find it. And uh, so, of course, I, I, the gallery and I engaged the services of an excellent craftsman, cabinet maker, and uh, with his help, we found the right material. Uh, it's different, but it's close, and we can only get close. But the, the shapes are the same. Shapes are the same, dimensions are the same. Dimensions are the right. same. But the mechanics that allow it to be flexed and adjusted and made different by the viewer participant have been improved. We improved them. We actually made a better mechanical solution than the first time. How many pieces? There are nine in the whole uh, enterprise. In it's, the an whole it's an ensemble of nine. Ensemble, nine. but to put together, how many do you make? Because each piece oh. is put together oh. by rotating, right? Well, there are five like elements in a, okay, in a five. set. Right, okay, right. 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 And they're, they're hinged, as it were, with, with an axle in the fashion of a carpenter's ruler. Yes. So they, they unfold and refold and re-refold, and so you can basically make a new work uh, by participating in the work itself. When you show that in the beginning and as n now showing it, do you expect the person who buys that piece of work to refigure it? Or do you refigure it at the, in the site? Or what happens? I don't really expect anything. What I, <laughs> what I think is that because there's a certain amount of challenge that is just physical challenge in moving the work around, that most people won't do that willy-nilly. They're not going to say... Keep moving it around. No, I think they'll probably arrive at um, a gesture that they like given the space and circumstances of where the piece is located and just leave it there. Was your career path always in art? As you started, were you always going to be an artist? You mean when I was nine or ten? When you were whenever. <laughs> when you went I, to college, I actually. wanted to, you know, when I was very young, I wanted to be a scientist. Oh, so. So. Uh, you were solving problems. Yeah, I was solving problems. I, and, and, but I, I sort of liked the phenomenological aspect of, you know, making things happen, you know. So I built a chemistry lab in my garage <laughs> and, you know, nearly blew the place up. And uh, it seemed that it was, I was going down the wrong path. <laughs> but so. but you do solve problems in your work because yes, yes. Um, I guess that's what an artist does, and you even more so because you're involved in so many public commissions. Uh, well, there's so many problems to solve in in making something uh, which we hope will be durable and a large scale uh, out of doors in a public place. You know, you don't want to create a liability uh, necessarily. Oh, so you have a lot and, of things uh, to look at. You have to, right, and I've <laughs> had to, you know, work with and consult with engineers and architects and uh, people with skills that I don't have. And, and that's always been very interesting. It's an interesting path for me. You yeah. taught a lot. You taught at CalArts. <clears throat> How do you teach an artist to be an artist? What do you teach an artist? <laughs> what do you teach? Actually? John, that's that's the the, the the question with the heavy weight, you know. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. How do you know if a person's talented? Well, that's that's the in the realm of the intuition of the teacher. Yeah, you know, that you really, it is. really, you you have to be able to intuit what this person's sensibility is or, or sensibilities and are. And can you tell it easily? <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes some people have kind of innate skills, but they uh, are uh, 
captive of some idea about what an artist is. So they're really more kind of invested in being the thing, being the thing. rather than going on the road, yeah, and taking the trip, the journey. You know. And getting to where they want to go. Well, yeah. that's the thing, being the thing, bringing something like this and putting it here in front of us, like your piece of art. This is Basso. Basso, tell me Basso about Michon. Basso. Thank you. Basso uh, represents <clears throat> um, work that I'm doing currently. And it's a huge shift away from the public art, from oh. the scale and materiality and so right. on. Right. Uh, you did these big flower forms out of... Uh, Felt, is it? Uh, flower forms. Where did you see the flower forms? I saw that. I thought it was well, at the gallery. It's circles, I guess, maybe. And Are I you referring it, yes. to the gallery? Yes, to me it was a ah, flower form. Interesting. It was very melodic. That's and... great. I, I love that perception because I've always seen it as a hat. Oh, really? Yes. And I, it's called capsize. Oh, it is capsized. Yes, okay, but it's made out of this material. It's made out of this, but but this is industrial felt, and industrial felt comes in all sort of thicknesses and densities and colors and so on. Uh, this is a, this is a particularly soft uh, one of the possibilities. It's very soft material. This reminds me of the Joseph Boy's coat. Yes. Is that the same kind of well? I think that felt? Mater that felt was probably a little denser pound per square yard mm -hmm. than this is, but. Uh, Yes, I've always enjoyed his his take on felt. So and and how, yeah. how did you get into this material? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> oh, you want me to ask that question? <laughs> well, you know, I, I really fatigue, got so much fatigue from the public art, art uh, uh, toiling, uh, and uh, I won't go into that. But um, as you get older, you know, you look for sort of uh, <laughs> opportunities, you know, that will... Uh, perhaps preclude the necessity to be jumping in and out of holes in the ground, you know, for the yeah, rest of your life. Yeah, like, right? yes, yeah. like many of the pieces yeah. that you've and, done. And uh, so this came about in my exploration of other materials, and it started with paper, oh. and sort of winding paper around itself. And I liked that, it felt right, but, <laughs> but it didn't feel right enough because I wanted the material to be thicker, yeah, but, but, then you had but to have flexibility and manipulability malleability so it was kind of a natural evolution from paper to felt and and uh, so so felt would not be a lasting substance that you would use in public art not the yet outside no, but not you must yet. think of the yurts you know of, the oh, North, right, A of right. North Asia that are made of wool and they seem to hold up pretty well you but know. you know you did this fantastic woven cone at Cal yeah, Arts that yeah. people talked about and they yeah. used it as a landmark on one of your early public commissions and it was like a landmark on campus and it didn't last it's gone truly but it lasted quite a long time you know yes, I, I, but something I did that, like uh, this well that's cast concrete of course this is cast concrete yeah. this should last forever it, it should, unless somebody decides that they want to put up a building right there on the site. Well, that's you know, a so problem. What absolutely. is the name of this one? Gyro. That's called Gyro Jack. And where is this? It's in Seattle uh, at uh, 3rd and Bell Street in the Denny Reed grade area. It's a little mm. north of downtown. Mm. I'm going to just show a couple yeah. of these just yeah. because you have done so much public art, and public art is so well, I'll just hold this difficult. corner up a bit. Uh, also in the Northwest, that's on the campus of Western Washington University, and that's called Log Ramps. And, and, the, and uh, it's made of logs from the area, uh, all timbers from the Northwest. So, but things like this probably won't last forever no. either. As a matter of fact, that piece has been rebuilt once already. Oh, so it they started can... in 74, was rebuilt in 81, maybe. Is, is that against your feelings when no. something is rebuilt? No, well, the, this was actually... <laughs> We're back to that old subject. Uh, this site was presumably vouchsafe for 20 years, but the the build the master plan for the campus was overridden or something, and they uh. they just said, "Hey, we want to put a new building there, so we'll have to take the sculpture down." And they did, and they didn't even ask me. They removed it, and then said, "Oh, you know what? Well, we removed your sculpture. Oh dear me. Oh dear. Uh, maybe we should rebuild it." So we found a site just 100 yards away, rebuilt the whole piece, and you can't, you went, and I in went there and rebuilt to it. it yes. Um, when I was on the Arts Council, this was one of the commissions from the state, and yes. it was at Exposition Park yes. called it 21, still be there. Stones. 21 Stones. But this is something that won't go away. 
I don't think so. A stone. I no. mean, the space maybe. Well, is that the you problem? Know, well, if the space is dedicated as this park space is, you know. I and mean, it was a spiral? Yes, and these are, are California granite boulders, and they um, are arranged as points in a spiral that begins at the sidewalk adjacent right. to the site, and they move in and in diminishing intervals, and also the heights increase as you move to the center. How, if somebody's driving along the street, do they know that that's art? They don't. <laughs> well, that's a good No, point. I like the idea. It fits into the quotidian. It becomes part of the common experience. It doesn't stand up and say, I am. You know. Well, this stands but up that, and says, but, I am. Yes, so but, this, you, you know, see, is our... It's another head. I put that other head on. This is downtown Los Angeles. That is downtown. Fourth and Lower Grand. <clears throat> and it's, it's called up the freeways and the cars. And it's, the, it's the inevitable loop of traffic uh, caught in the in the strangling loop but it's funny, though. It's and a funny how thing. do these ideas come to you and are they all they obviously are site specific yes yes well this site was only I don't know four feet wide and six yeah, feet long yeah it was just a little medium wasn't right. it and you know you can't hang anything out in the traffic zone so that, that was a constraint that had to be observed that was that was first and foremost and that's how that piece developed into a kind of puppet show for drivers. One thing, and I know this is really difficult, but public art, you either hate it or you love it. Uh, you take the brick bats and the curses, and then you get, you know, you get other things as well. And uh, I don't think that the, the vocal expressions of dislike are, are nearly as troubling as neglect on the one oh, hand. Oh, that's you know, interesting. That's really, you know, the, the neglect on the part of the, the owners, the caretakers of the work. And, Many of my pieces have just uh, been basically abandoned, you know, over time, and it's because personnel change at the various institutions, and uh, records are lost. Nobody knows what is you know, what is that thing anyway, and then they don't, you know, they don't they don't maintain the, the schedule that was important, that was part of the documentation that I gave them in the beginning. You know, these things. Yeah, those are, are the really, those are the cruel things. That's that's the stuff that. How makes can you we hard. stop that? I don't know. Uh, now maybe now with I, I computers it's easier. I don't know. Maybe those kind of documentations can be kept in, in computer records. But you know, with your background and the idea that you have uh, won so many of these commissions through um, juries, Com competitions juries and, so, yeah. and competitions, yeah. is just a big uh, attribute. Your fantastic work to thank you so let much. us know thank you. the thank you to the world and now they can go over to the uh, Cardwell Jimerson and see Jimerson. that yes and thank you so much and thank you very much too don't go away come back next time j a q u i n n the numeral 1 at aol.com email me and keep writing to 777 south figueroa we'll see you next time bye <laughs>